I'd just like to introduce our first speaker for this morning's session. Professor Manuel Solto Tellez is Professor and Chair of Molecular Pathology at the CCRCB and a Consultant Clinical Pathologist in the Belfast Healthcare Trust. He's also a visiting professor in the Department of Pathology and the Cancer Science Institute at the National University of Singapore, from whom we were delighted to have him come and join us. Manuel attended medical schools in three European countries, in Spain, Germany, and the Netherlands. And he then went on to train in pathology in Edinburgh, following a uh, <coughs> further subspecialist training in gastrointestinal pathology in London, and then in molecular pathology and molecular diagnostics in UPenn in USA in the year 2000. For the last 10 years until this spring, he's been trying to bring together phenotype and genotype in both diagnostics and translational research through his, his work in Singapore. He's author and co-author of more than 130 uh, peer-reviewed papers. His areas of interest in, in diagnosis are in gastrointestinal pathology and the integration of molecular diagnostics. In terms of his research interests, they're the discovery and validation of novel molecular biomarkers of disease, validation and technology transfer of novel discoveries into the molecular diagnostic practice, and in particular, the molecular pathology of the Runx family of genes. Manuel has had a very major impact since he joined us in March of this year, and we look forward very much to hearing his talk. Thank you, Manuel. Thank you very much, uh, Richard, for the very kind introduction and, uh, and also for the opportunity to be here today. Um, the task that I've been given is to talk about molecular testing of EGFR. And of course, the main question is, what does a molecular pathologist have to offer to an audience of translational oncology researchers, as, as you all are? And uh, probably one of the, of the main things that you may agree with me is that um, um, mo molecular pathology is probably a driver in taking this pipeline from basic science into, into diagnostics. Um, that, for a long time, probably didn't mean much. And allow me to put this in a, in a graphic way. This is a bottle. This is a bottle that is full of basic science discoveries. And this is a glass where the clinical and the diagnostic applications of all discoveries should flow. And this here is a bottleneck. Now, for years, we've been saying that the reason this didn't flow is because there was a lack of the proper knowledge of the biomarkers. Then we said that we didn't have the right technology to bring those biomarkers into the routine diagnostic setting. Now we are beginning to see that probably many of the studies, including clinical trials, that should give us the evidence for the use of those biomarkers may not be designed in the way that they should. The fact of the matter is that now, when we look at what is happening in the glass, we can probably agree that it's very much disease dependent. Some, for some diseases, this glass is absolutely empty. For others, we are beginning to see some flow. And if I understand correctly from the organizers, this is my task today. I'm going to focus on the glass, not on the bottle. And I'm going to try to bring some indications of how that may help translational researchers in the development of your biomarkers from, uh, um, from discovery into, into the, the, the molecular diagnostics. Um, some of them I'm going to present to you comes from two main sources. One is our own experience as molecular diagnosticians, almost 600 cases reporting EGFR testing, and also, as you can see below, a meeting of oncologists and pathologists uh, practicing in, in Asia, which is trying to bring together a morphomolecular clinical approach to EGFR testing and to the, to the uh, uh, treatment of these patients. Why are we here, as most of us, most of the time? Well, because there is a revolution going on in oncology. As you know, oncologists have now a series of antibodies and small molecule inhibitors that are allowing them to target a specific key genes and pathways in oncogenesis, and that is allowing them to revisit all enemies with new weapons. If you think that this list on the left is long, well, think about it. It was calculated in last year's a AACR that there are somewhere in the order of 850 studies looking at such compounds at different levels of clinical trials. So even if you are very pessimistic and you think that only one or two percent of these are going to be successful at the end of the day, it is likely that this list is going to double or triple in the next two to three years. The important thing for us is that this revolution in oncology is also deeply transforming the way we practice pathology. 
We know now that there are at least six main cancer types where there are very specific single biomarker tests, the genotype of which is going to tell us which patients are going to respond to which drugs. And what my labs have been trying to do in the past is to show that we can do this testing in a confident manner with published track record, and also, if I may say so, that we are doing it in an integrated manner. In other words, that molecular diagnostics does not stand alone, but is fully integrated in the whole process of, of molecular diagnostics. In other words, what we are aiming at the end of the day is to provide a single diagnostic opinion for the oncologist from the moment we are describing the macro of a specimen that we get from the moment in which we are reporting the last PCR uh, result. Probably to understand EGFR molecular testing, we need to go back a little bit to the history, to the time in the 60s in which someone discovered that there was a protein that was encouraging epithelial growth, to the 70s in which somebody discovered the receptor associated with a protein, and then the 80s in which Axel Ulrich told us that indeed modifications in the tyrosine kinase domain of those proteins were key in oncogenesis. And after that, well, after that, we can follow the model that I showed you earlier on. We have John Mendelssohn telling us that those receptors were present in lung adenocarcinoma, 1987. Five years later, telling us that if you were able to block that activity, you were able to block or to slow down uh, uh, malignant growth. Ten years up to the time in which the first oral inhibitor was produced, and then the two seminal papers from the neighboring uh, um, uh, Harvard laboratories, one day this should be explained to us, in which they came at the same time telling us that in fact it was mutations in the, in the EGFR gene in adenocarcinomas that were more likely to respond to therapy. And then the subsequent papers that are telling us how to use this information in clinical and in diagnostic setting. 20 years of journey. Now what we have at the end of the day is a very distinguished member of a very distinguished family of, of transmembrane proteins where there is a very clear uh, a uh, a kinase um, um, element that is governing the oncogenic functions of these cells, but also is the main target of the drugs that we are using uh, for these patients. Now, if you look at the way the biomarker was developed, the biomarker really followed, probably not in such orderly way as I'm telling you here, the same discovery as other markers. So at some point, there was an, a, a, a query as to whether it was protein expression or gene copy number or mutation analysis that was really related to the, uh, um, uh, to the way these patients were doing. And in fact, what we saw with EGFR is the same paradigm that we've seen in other places. And these are essentially the overlap between these three levels is not perfect, and therefore we have to test and see which is the one that better serves our, our clinical needs. In this case, I think it's obvious that this mutation, not only we've seen this empirically because of the information that we have from some of the main clinical trials, but also the basic biology is telling us that if you have a modification of that receptor, then that receptor is more likely to, uh, to activate and therefore to, to have oncogenic effect. So, because of this, probably EGFR has reached a, reached a point in which it becomes one paradigm for molecular testing together with perhaps HER2 in the context of breast cancer or, or perhaps KRAS testing in, 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 in colorectal cancer. And I would like to take you very briefly and systematically to some of the aspects of this routine testing which perhaps may change in some ways the way you are validating your biomarkers uh, uh, currently. The first thing to note is the diagnostic testing model that we are using. When we look about molecular testing, and this is a very simplistic way of looking at, at, at uh, analysis and diagnosis of adenocarcinoma, first of all, a histopathological analysis followed by a molecular analysis. In molecular testing, we need to focus here, or we tend to focus here. I would like to argue that if we have an integrated approach to this, we are going to be better. We are going to have better turnaround times, we are going to have more efficient diagnostics, and we are probably going to be more accurate. So how do we integrate molecular diagnostics in the overall flow of the diagnostics in a, in a hospital? 
This is a model, this is the first model that we started using in Singapore, not necessarily the best one, but uh, just to give you an example of the several that I'm going to use today. We get material, if it is definite adenocarcinoma, the pathologist initiates the testing of EGFR. If it is not adenocarcinoma, then we know that there are other treatment options. If we are in that gray area of, look, I think it's not a small cell, but I'm not sure, what we started doing, which perhaps is not necessary right now, is to have a very thorough pathological review of the case. If that proved to be definite adenocarcinoma, we went ahead with the test. If not, then we will discuss with the oncologist what was the specific uh, way of doing this. And as I'll show you later on, this approach probably has some, some advantages. What that integrated approach allows you to do as well is to integrate your reports so that when the patient arrives in front of the oncologist, you already have all the information that is necessary to decide on therapeutic intervention in one single report. As you can see there, the first three aspects of that report are a conventional histopathology report. The last two are telling you what is the molecular profile of what we are putting forward so that then therapeutic decision making can be instituted. The methodology is always an issue. And the more important a test becomes, the more methods are going to be out there. Remember, the EGFR gene is very large. The tyrosine kinase domain is much smaller. So with four PCR reactions, we're really covering all the genome that is interesting from the point of view of therapeutic response. We can divide tests in two ways, the ones you can buy off the shelf, the ones you can develop yourself. The main characteristics of that that you can buy is essentially that they are reporting very good analytical sensitivities. They're reporting, as you can see on the right, very reasonable turnaround time. The problem being that, obviously, they are not so good at covering all the possible variables that you want to take into account for um, a therapeutic um, 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 decision making. Um, this is obviously because there are two main types of mutations within EGFR that they are the commoner, the deletions exon 19, the point mutation in exon 21, but then there are others that probably represent one in 10 patients that may not be covered by the majority of those kids. The alternative is to do it homebrew. Um, the analytical sensitivities are, as you can see, somewhat different. The turnaround may be longer, but then what you are ensuring that yourself, particularly with Sanger sequencing, is that you are covering the whole spectrum that may be clinically uh, um, meaningful. Whatever the choice is, and it's not today's remit to, to, to indicate which is the best one, uh, you have to have very strong validations, verifications, and QC, QA in your laboratory. Because the experience of many of us is that reported sensitivities by off-the-shelf kids do not translate to actual sensitivities when you are setting up the test in your own laboratory. And that is very important. The clinical materials are becoming very relevant. For some people, what we are living at the moment is, is a revolution of, of the small sample. The needles are getting smaller, the materials are getting more scanty, and yet the information that we've been asked to provide is, is more significant. How do we deal with this? I started paying interest in this when we were involved in this study. This is a Japanese, Australian, Singaporean study. We analyzed more than 100 cases for EGFR, including cases like this. 66-year-old lady, 4.5 centimeter cancer. The only material that we had at the time was the cell block from the cytology specimen. DNA was extract extracted. The mutation was detected subsequently when we had every, when we could go back to the resection specimen, the mutation was confirmed. This was, was very encouraging, and what we did two or three years later is to review our performance in EGFR testing. And, and it has very interesting uh, uh, observations. We can do EGFR testing in four main clinical types, if you want. On the top left, the main chunks of tissue that we get from resection specimens, or the core biopsies from peripheral tumors, or the bronchoscopic biopsies from central lesions, or the cytology that comes from FNAs or from pleural effusions. The fact of the matter is that if we look at our unsatisfactory rate, you will see that by far cytology seems to be the preferred uh, sample to do EGFR testing. This is in an environment in which we were serving 
more than 30 hospitals across Asia and with different qualities of materials, as you can imagine. But this was very interesting. And in fact, when you look at our performance in the two main hospitals that we were serving for EGFR testing, you realize that the oncologists in Hospital A, which were convinced that our performance in cytology samples was significantly better, they all were wanting us to do it on cytology samples because in the first instance, it was the first material that was available in a significant significant number of patients. And this probably what it has to do at some point is allow us to review some of the international uh, 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 recommendations, which always tend to prefer tissue versus other samples, but probably the work in cytology samples or future work in, in, in blood samples is going to, to challenge this, this, this paradigm. Whatever it is, the use of clinical materials for molecular uh, uh, um, uh, purposes is challenged significantly by molecular diagnostics. And again, let me take you through a diagram. We sample something to understand what is the diagnosis. If we have enough material and we can produce a diagnosis, we do so. If we don't, then we may have to go back and take more sample. Once this is established, the question is, can we make a therapeutic decision based on molecular testing. If we can, that's very good. If we don't, we have to go back and take more sample. And this essentially is putting pressure to main, three main groups of, of practicing uh, doctors. Those that are at the forefront of getting the materials, endoscopies, pneumologists, etc., because obviously the amount of material matters. It's putting pressure with pathologies because it's not only a matter anymore of having good morphology and good immunohistochemistry. DNA preservation is essential. And for oncologists as well, because even when you do this very well, there will be occasions in which this will not work and you will have to invite your patient to get a second, a second biopsy. Turnaround time is a measure of um, um, the quality of, of a molecular diagnostic service, probably as much as the accuracy of the test itself. This is my favorite paper of turnaround times of all times. These are essentially the Harvard hospitals reporting their first experience with the first 100 or 150 EGFR tests. It's a very candid paper, and at the end, there is a discussion between oncologists and pathologists. Let me, let me take you briefly through some of it. Oncologist one. So it takes you three to four weeks to get a result. Is it a way of doing this faster? Pathologist one. Well, you can run your sequencer, but then you have to confirm your results. Pathologist too, actually, is finding the block that is stopping us. Getting the result after that is not so difficult. Pathologist three, you know, sometimes it's the block, sometimes it's the sequencer. This is what we have. Oncologist two, well, I know this goes on the face of science, but if I put the patient on the drug from day one, I know if it is responding faster than what it takes you to give me the, the pathology report. So. <laughs> turnaround time matters. And when you look at turnaround time, you know that there are analytical and pre-analytical uh, indicators of turnaround time. We know for experience that even a cumbersome test like EGFR testing by Sanger sequencing can be brought from three uh, working or from, from three weeks into three to five working days. It, it is possible. The reporting of the results is very important. Now, there are two schools of thoughts. I report what I have and that's it, or I help you interpreting the results. Obviously, in my case, I tend to do the second. Any pathology report of this kind should have different sections, including a clear indication of what is the clinical significance. The clinical significance of the test itself, but also the clinical significance of the result that you are generating with your specific analysis. And there are many different uh, combinations here. You may have the commonest mutations that are associated with, with, uh, with um, response. You may have a mutation that is rare, but there is anecdotal evidence that they may give sensitivity to the drug. Then we say so and we reference it. There may be a mutation that you don't know what it's doing. There may be a mutation that is conferring resistance or there may be a mutation that you don't know what it's doing, but it's an exon that usually is associated with resistance. 
This is very important. We look at the result, we look at the, at the literature, we look at the data sets, and we interpret, and we help interpreting what we see. The issue of single versus multiple biomarkers is very interesting in the context of lung cancer, and probably lung cancer is becoming one of the three paradigms for that. We know that there is a paradigm in colon cancer and cetuximab treatment. For a while, we were analyzing BRAF mutations as well as KRAS mutations for therapeutic decision making. We know that in the context of lung cancer, it may pay off to understand what is the mode of resistance to TKIs because there may be ways of acting upon it. And certainly in breast cancer, there are now many drugs, many of which are associated with a biomarker that are helping us to complete the HER2 blockade and probably truncated P95 protein in, in the context of lapatinib is going to be something that is going to come very soon. The, one of the main leaders of the clinical trials that we mentioned in earlier on in an exercise of simplicity tells you that as far as he is concerned, adenocarcinoma of the lung is divided in two, EGFR mutant and EGFR wild type. We are trying to tell him and others that even if the whole thing is relatively simple, it's probably more difficult than that and perhaps we should divide it at least in four. Because we know that adenocarcinomas with EGFR mutation, KRAS mutations and ALK translocations are relatively mutually exclusive and they probably have different biological and therapeutic um, 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 indications. In any case, and I thought you may be interested to see these data, which I only saw three weeks ago when I was, I was um, um, lecturing in, in, in Vietnam. This, is, this comes from the AstraZeneca laboratory in Shanghai. I've analyzed 150 adenocarcinomas. Two things to note, one, the percentage of mutants EGFR in the Asian population, which is very much consistent with what we saw as well, but also look the amount of ALK fusions that there are in their, in their series. I'm not sure if this will translate as well into Caucasian population, but I think this is something that is worth looking at. Certainly, ALK inhibitors are becoming another treatment option. In the last year or year and a half, the way we've looked at this from a point of view of diagnostics is with the VICES probe for, for uh, uh, translocations. There is some early indication, if I'm not mistaken, that there may be an antibody that can look at this more simply, but I don't, I don't have experience on this, uh, and I only have experience on the, on the FISH probe. Whatever it is, if there are more biomarkers and there are more treatment options, we have to change the way we move this in the routine setting. And perhaps from this model that I showed you earlier on, we should have a model in which the moment we know is a small cell carcinoma, we know that there are other options. If it is not a small cell carcinoma, we may want to start doing EGFR. If it is wild type, we may want to do KRAS testing. If it is wild type, we may want to do ALK translocation analysis. Perhaps with an added step for a screening with an antibody, if we really show that that is of any, any significance. Obviously, this is a cost-effective way of using resources. If you are in an environment in which that doesn't matter, you can do the three of them up front and get in the same, the same information. Whatever it is, it's important to allow pathologists to be the ones initiating molecular testing. And this, is, this you can see very clearly here. This would be the normal process. You have an histological diagnosis, we issue a report, which goes to the physician, the patient is referred to the oncologist, the patient meets the oncologist, oh, we need, we need a GFR testing. The average time for this process is probably around 26 days in our setting. If you allow pathologists to initiate the test at this level, in three to four working days, the patient is already ready to be discussed in a multidisciplinary meeting and to decide on therapeutic intervention. Molecular diagnostics is changing the taxonomy of how we look at cancer. Remember the challenge of the then director of NCI more than 10 years ago. Researchers find results that will move us from a morphological classification of disease into a molecular classification of disease. And believe me, this caused extraordinary panic in the pathology community. If you see the papers that follow this, some of our leading pathologists at the time 
were either trying to show that we could be relevant or directly announcing the death of pathology as such. What are we after 15 years? Well, there are more and more samples coming to pathology departments. And what is important, we are believing to see that the baseline for excellent molecular testing is excellent morphological analysis. So we are beginning to see that this is not mutually exclusive, but they're complementary. Now, the taxonomy is definitely changing. This is the way hist conventional histopathologists look at adenocarcinoma of the lung. I've never seen one oncologist making a treatment decision based on any of those subgroups. We have a molecular uh, a, a way of, of, of taxonomy of adenocarcinoma now. But this is also changing the value of the pathologies uh, um, uh, report. Long are the days in which all we had to do is a small cell versus non-small cell, because that was the only treatment option. Where the pathology sits now in this morphological continuum between adenocarcinoma and squamous cell carcinoma matters a lot, because it may be a decision indicator, first of all, of which patients are going to go for mutation analysis, and also for QAQC is going to tell us what is the likelihood of some of these patients to actually get a mutation. High throughput technologies and testing. Um, what do we know so far from the example of lung cancer? The best example is probably the battle trial. Four possible treatment options based on the analysis of eight biomarkers that we know are associated with treatment. What is the problem? That as you can see, the biomarkers are all over the place. We have two biomarkers that are essentially based on DNA mutation analysis, two that are gene copy number, four that are uh, immunohistochemistry. And this is the difficulty of moving at the moment biomarker analysis from single routine, routine biomarker into a proper high throughput technology. It's true that we are using uh, gene, gene expression arrays as part of high throughput technologies, and we know that there are many examples of the kind. If you look at this critically though, there are always two things that are coming in mind. One is that there may be a lack of solid randomized prospective clinical trials to support the use of these, of these signatures. Secondly, that a single, these are usually single lab results, and we don't know about the reproducibility. Probably one uh, um, um, things like the MINDAC trial start maturing, we'll understand if genuinely up, up, um, stratification based on gene expression matters. We are using high throughput analysis in early phase clinical trials, but it's usually for discovery. Once you have analyzed that and you have your biomarkers of choice, we'll be continue using a high throughput technology to detect those biomarkers of notes that remains to be seen. Third generation uh, sequencing is a very, very important topic right now. Um, we don't have a solution, but we are beginning to think about that and having some ideas. One of them is that obviously that degree of analysis is going to allow you to detect mutations that are druggable, that are possibly druggable, and most of them that are undruggable. Now, we cannot use treatment options that have not been proved before. So at the time, what this is allowing us to do is to have a significant collection of information for the future. What do we need to do if we want to do bring next-gen sequencing into a proper diagnostic tool? We are beginning to think that probably it has to be, the validation has to follow a strict uh, molecular diagnostic criteria. It has to be technical and probably also functional. It has to be placed in accredit accredited laboratories and probably needs to include clinical trial material as part of the validation. And we are beginning to design models in which we have a gold standard, in which we have form functional confirmation, and hopefully we also have a clinical trial material. I hope I've been able to convince you that EGFR is becoming a very strong prototype of the present of molecular diagnostics and also of the future. Mr. Chairman, I would like to take just one minute to present you the molecular pathology program that we are developing here in, 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 in CCRCB, a way in which we want to put together the activity of hospitals, of our center, and some of the local industry that is already present in, in, in the system. The molecular pathology program has three main arms. The molecular diagnostic one that I've uh, discussed today, the biobank that is led by Dr. Jackie James, and the molecular pathology translational research. 
In the latter, what we are trying to do is to put together a collection of technologies and access to tissues and clinical information that will allow us to bridge the interest of our scientists and our industry with the materials that are present in our hospitals. Uh, this is already happening, and we're very much looking forward to collaborate with you in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Manuel, for a wonderful talk. We're actually ahead of schedule, so we've plenty of time for questions. I'd like to open it to the floor. I don't know what the what the way it is now in um, in in um, in Belfast, uh, because as I said, this is work in progress, and the information that I have presented is is from my my previous work. So I don't know what is the choice of the oncologists here. I can tell you that in our previous practice, the decisive um, component to decide on 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 the testing was the fact that it was adenocarcinoma or an histology close to adenocarcinoma. Those will always uh, go for testing. And if we did that, our rate of mutation detection was in the order, in the Asian context, in the order of 45%. I'm not, I'm not aware of it, I'm not aware of it. Paddy? Manuel, great, great talk. Um, can you just highlight very clearly one of the bottlenecks in the Victoria study, and that is pathologists. Hmm. And so one of the challenges that I see and we have experienced is pathologists are not geared up to do this, they're not trained to do this. Absolutely. So, can I give any thoughts on, on what to me that is the bottleneck, and I agree entirely with your, with your thesis and presentation? Yeah. But we're shortening our timeline if pathologists are trained to do this. In yeah. the same way as we think about training in, in diagnostic interpretation. Yeah. Yeah. So, we've started to work on, on along those lines because to me this is also very critical, and we are doing that at three levels. There are already histopathologies in the system that has expressed an interest in being retrained as molecular diagnosticians, and there is already one doing that. That our trainees, some of them, probably the brightest ones, are signing for PhDs that are going to incorporate training in molecular diagnostics. Um, after the president of the Royal College of Pathologists visited us, there is a committee in the Royal College that is essentially going to look into that. The idea being that there will be a formal training to have an FRC path in molecular diagnostics. And also something that is very important, I think that the national uh, accreditation agencies are not geared to, to accredit molecular diagnostic laboratories. So again, we've been invited by UCAS and CPA to be part of a committee that is specifically going to look into that. Obviously, this is going to take a little while to mature. Um, but I think we are in the right track. Dean? Honestly speaking, the model of could I am buying a kid, I'm question? buying... Uh, Manuel, Sorry. excuse me. Could you repeat the question so that it can also be recorded? Yes. So the question is essentially if with the technological advances that we are having, 
if really there is a point to have a cent central light laboratories to provide molecular diagnostics or if we are going through a decentralized model. And this has been a dichotomy that has been going on for a long time in, in molecular testing, not only in oncology, but molecular diagnosis of infectious diseases, etc. My feeling is that the days in which you buy a machine, you get a little kit and you start doing molecular testing are probably gone. If we see the challenges that we are seeing here, it is doubtful that there will be many healthcare providers that will be able by themselves to afford the technology that is going to be necessary for this kind of work. And that's why here we're going for a hybrid model in which essentially university and healthcare uh, trust is, are coming together. I believe much more in a, in a centralized model. Dr. Murphy. Thanks, Richard. <clears throat> Just for the audience and for our speakers, all of this is being videotaped and will be made into podcasts for on-demand video viewing from your computers very soon after the conclusion of the meetings tomorrow. As a consequence of that, if you don't use one of these two microphones, please to the speakers if they would reprise the question uh, so that that can be recorded as well as the answer. Thank you. Now for a question, Manuel. And again, I, I salute you on a, an absolutely splendid, not just overview, but an in-depth uh, appraisal that um, asks each of us what we can do better and more of. One of the things that you also highlighted, or described at least, was the battle trial, an adaptive clinical trial design by, I think, um, principally by Jack Lee at MD Anderson. Yeah. And another one that is adaptive that is now ongoing, as we all know, is the iSpy2 trial for breast cancer. And those are two of the most, uh, perhaps, uh, early and, and important adaptive clinical trial designs. But really, what you're bringing about here and discussing with us this morning is to also encourage that future and further adaptive clinical trials must in fact be designed and implemented. And I wonder if you have a, any a, a opinion or comment on that. I know that um, Patty and the team have designed later in the program to have some discussions on this, but it might be helpful to have your introduction as well. Thank you. Yeah, with, with pl pleasure. So it's, it's, really, it's really paradoxical in many ways. So, one of the studies that everyone wants to do, but is very difficult to do, is to say, okay, let's get cancers, let's sequence them, let's understand what is their druggable mutations, and let's treat those patients based on the genomics, regardless of the site of origin. That would be very logical, but that would be the, if you want the other end of the spectrum. But we cannot do that, because we don't have sufficient evidence that a HER2 overamplified colon cancer is going to be similar than a HER2 overamplified breast or gastric. We don't know that an EGFR mutated breast cancer is going to respond like an EGFR mutated lung cancer. And that is my struggle when I try to design novel uh, uh, diagnostics for, for novel trials. If you don't use the biomarkers that have already been established, then you need to have a discovery arm in your trial. And we are struggling. We are struggling in trying to find a, a baseline in which we can be a little bit more creative in the way we are using all the vast amount of knowledge that we are going to get from next-gen sequencing and from other sources into the design of those trials. <clears throat> 